Ave Maria, praise to you, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, just uh, before we get to the sermon, I'll start today with a, a serious warning. Uh, and I mean it. Uh, Pope Francis has invited thousands of Catholic Charismatics and members of Pentecost on evangelical churches to Rome to celebrate Pentecost, mark the 50th anniversary of what became the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. There will be a prayer vigil June 3rd, the eve of Pentecost, at Rome's Circus Maximus, an open field that was the site of an ancient Roman stadium used for chariot races. So uh, we're going to have Catholics, Pentecostals, and Evangelicals all gathered together, invoking uh, whatever spirit. The devil is an opportunist. And boy, this is an opportunity for him. And you don't want to open any doors to him. So don't watch this on TV or the internet. Don't watch any clips of whatever happens there. Mortify your curiosity. Just pray. Don't even look at pictures of anything that goes on there. So if you, uh, if you want context for the whole charismatic movement, you might uh, watch a documentary called Marjo. It's hard to watch. It's about a, a Pentecostalist preacher that's really taken advantage of, of nice people. But Marjo, it was filmed almost uh, 45 years ago or so. Marjo, and that'll give you some context. But keep away from this. Don't, don't look into it. Okay, you've been warned. Last week, we spoke of the spiritual life, of the supernatural life of grace. We saw that in that life, the supernatural life of sanctifying grace, there are three ages which are analogous to the three ages, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood of the natural life. We saw that the first age of the spiritual life The age of a spiritual child is known as a purgative life or the life of beginners. And that the focus at this stage should be on continually staying in a state of grace by avoiding all mortal sin and all deliberate venial sin, on denying oneself, on conquering vices and evil tendencies, and on growing in the virtues by faithfully performing exterior and interior mortification and developing a true life of prayer. We saw that there are two very, very different forms of purgative life. In some, this form of life is very intense, they're generous. We saw that these souls are serious about becoming saints. They want to follow the straight, narrow path of perfect self-denial. We saw that in most, the purgative life appears in a weaker form, varying from good souls who are a little weak, all the way down to those lukewarm souls who are complacent in their lack of of generosity, whose motto is really, if the minimum wasn't good enough, it wouldn't be the minimum. And as a result of their worldliness, those souls are in terrible risk of hellfire. We saw that mental prayer, and today we're going to describe just what we mean by mental prayer. We saw that the mental prayer of those in the purgative life is generally discursive. And that means it goes from point to point. They think and pray about this, and they go like this, and they go like this, and they go like this. And it's typically marked by many sensible consolations. What we mean by sensible con- consolations are feelings of love, of peace. They're good feelings as the people have given themselves over to prayer. It's marked by that. We also saw that if one of these souls is faithful in his striving, he will come to transition. And that's a transition from the age of spiritual childhood, the purgative life, the life of a beginner, to the spiritual age, which is analogous to that of an adolescent. This life is called the illuminative life, or the life of proficiency. And this stage of the spiritual life is characterized by a much simpler sort of prayer. So instead of going from one point to the next to the next, they just go to point. And there they are. And they're not doing that. This isn't some kind of weird Eastern exercise. It's by the grace of God. We also saw that during the transition from the spiritual childhood of the purgative life to the spiritual adolescence of the luminative life, there's a crisis. It's analogous to the crisis of puberty in the natural life and the transition from childhood to uh, adolescence. But in the spiritual life, there's a crisis known as the dark night of the senses or the passive purification of the senses. 
And the crisis is actually caused by God. What's he doing? He's pouring into the soul a certain measure of this higher, simpler type of prayer that's proper to those who are in the illuminative way. But since the soul is not yet strong enough for that illumination, it actually blinds it. The spiritual life is too intense for the soul to handle at that time. It's roughly analogous to the experience we've all had. Um, if we've walked out of, of a very dark room into blinding sunlight, we're disoriented, it hurts. Uh, we can tell our eyes adjust. It's very painful. We just can't see clearly. This is an analogy to that. God is calling a soul in the dark night of the senses higher. He's called to higher levels of prayer. And this crisis is something that just has to be surmounted if there is going to be any progress. And oftentimes people will turn back at this instead of going forward. Because they don't realize it's going to hurt to go forward. They look at the crucifix, but they don't really, it hasn't registered that that it actually is the sign of our religion. And that is the way forward, huh? At this time, the soul is also overcome with terrible dryness. But if he perseveres, he'll enter in the illuminative way. It's painful, but it can be done. And not only is the person growing very significantly in holiness in this process, he's also getting out of significant amounts of purgatory time. So that pain is awesome because he's growing in virtue, and at the same time, he doesn't have to do time in purgatory for any of that. Huh? In that case, there's also two possibilities, though. Those who are generous... And have fixed their will on faithfully following up Calvary and those who are less generous. Okay. Finally, we pointed out that by virtue of your baptism, everyone here has been called to the limited life. But whether or not you get there before your death actually depends on you. It depends on you and your generosity in picking up and embracing your cross. Okay, so much for our review. Today, we'll talk about one of the most important means, in fact, an absolutely critical means for making advancements in the spiritual life, and that is mental prayer. So for the rest of the sermon, we're going to quote at length from a brilliant little work called The Little Catechism of the Life of Prayer. It's by the great Discalced Carmelite spiritual director, the late, great Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene. As usual, the, edit, the quotes have been pretty severely edited and cut and pasted. So question, what is a prayer? Prayer is conversation with God in which we manifest to him the desires of our hearts. Prayer can be vocal or mental. What is vocal prayer? Vocal prayer is that in which we recite a formula which expresses our desires. For example, our Father. We recite this with the intention of honoring God or the saints. Often we do not think in a distinct way in the sense of the words we're pronouncing, but that doesn't hinder our prayer from being true prayer, as long as the soul remains turned towards God with the desire of honoring. It can't just be chatter, 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 chatter. What is mental prayer? Mental prayer consists in talking to God with the heart in a spontaneous manner without prepared or memorized formulas. What do we say to God in mental prayer? We share with God all the desires of our heart. The great doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Jesus, that's St. Teresa of Avila, teaches that we should prefer to tell God that we love him, or at least that we desire to love him. Why speak to God especially of love? Because it's love that makes friendship flourish and leads to intimacy. And according to St. Teresa, we ought to become great friends, intimate friends of our Lord. Is it also necessary to think in prayer? To love God, it is necessary to think of Him. This might be a somewhat prolonged reflection on God's love for us, but it also might be a simple remembrance of the Lord's lovableness and of His goodness. In prayer, we think only to love. That's important. In prayer, we think only to love, to nourish love. St. Teresa says that prayer consists not in thinking much, but in loving much. What is love? There's a sensible love and a love of the will. Sensible love consists in a feeling that draws us affectionately towards someone and makes us experience pleasure in that person's company or in thinking of them. 
Love of the will consists in willing the good for the person. In other words, sensible love has to do with feelings, with liking. And love of the will may very well not have nothing to do with the feelings at all. It's easy to tell a difference if we remember that parents always love their teenagers, even though sometimes they might not like them very much. The love is in the will. The feelings are the sensible love. Which one of these is true love? Love of the will. Sensible love, although it's pleasant, is of secondary importance. The experience of a sensible love of God does not depend on us. In other words, even if we want to, we're not always going to get these warm fuzzies just by thinking about God, are we? But our love of the will for God does depend on us. Why would we naturally desire sensible love? We desire it for its sweetness because it provides comfort and consolation. It's precisely for this reason that in sensible love, we often seek ourselves. Well, with the love of the will, we seek God. Thus, he often takes a sensible love away from us to make us more walk more resolutely with the will alone. The old expression is, we have to be in love with the God of consolations, not with the consolations of God. Consolations are sensible love. We have to be in love with the God of consolations, not the consolations of God. And that's why he will take them away sometimes. With which love should we love God in prayer? Certainly with the love of the will, this being more important. If sensible love, consolations, happen to be added to this, then instead of our seeking pleasure in it, we should profit by its aid to strengthen our will in giving ourselves to God. When sensible love is lacking, we should continue with the will alone. How can I get started in this loving conversation with our Lord? In the beginning of the life of prayer, many people encounter great difficulties and experience boredom, or else their conscience of being very distracted. And it's important for me to insert here. If you get serious about starting life in mental prayer, in the beginning, it is going to be difficult. I'll guarantee it. And you will be finding about 40, 11 really good reasons why you don't need to do it right now or today, etc., etc., etc. See, once the devil sees you getting serious, he just puts out a cigarette and then he goes to work. It's like, "Uh uh-oh. And then he's going to go out. And how is he going to do that? He's going to tempt you to do things that are good, but they're not praying. Most people don't realize the devil does tempt to do good because he'll tempt you towards a lesser good. If he sees you're going to go pray and he says, well, you better call this person to do that. No. If you want to do this, you have to make up your mind to do this and make up your mind that nothing, and that means nothing barring explosions and sucking chest wounds and things of that level, that nothing is going to stop you from doing it, and then you just plow ahead. Mental prayer is something you have to will to do, and that's something also that you can learn. So it is going to be difficult in the beginning. You make up your mind you're going to do it. And it's going to be difficult, but you can learn it. There are methods to mental prayer, and because there are, today we're briefly going to cover the Carmelite method. It's based on the teachings of those great doctors of the church, St. Teresa of Jesus and St. John of the Cross. Now before we get to that, I would like to suggest you pick a time and a place to do this daily and be somewhat a stickler about both those points, granting that some people have to travel and so forth. But outside of the, pick a time and a specific place. If you have a big closet, you can put a, a, a crucifix in there, a nail there, a chair if you can't do it. A corner of the room, someplace consistent that you can go to every day. Senior Angel of the Blessed Sacrament, unless you live across the church from uh, uh, to, across the street from church or something, do this in the same place at home and be like the Carthusians. They pray in their cells, and they send their angel of the Blessed Sacrament. There is certainly nothing wrong with going to pray before the Blessed Sacrament. That's ideal. But if you don't already have the habit, that's not the good way to start. Then you're trying to start two things at once. One is going to a church and getting it done, the other is getting the mental prayer. Start with the mental prayer in one place, okay? If you already go every day, great, then you can do that. All right. Send your angel to the Blessed Sacrament. And that, when you start, I would recommend 10 to 15 minutes for the first three months. So you just you pick one of those and you stick with it. 10 or 15 minutes. And then at the end of three months, you add five minutes and so forth. Next, at three months later, you add five minutes. 
Over time, you'll build up your time in mental prayer, and you get better at it. And if you're faithful to this, somehow, even though you're spending more time in prayer, it's not going to impact your duties the rest of the day. And that you can only experience. You have to take it on faith. God and Our Lady are in charge of this thing, so somehow they stretch things around. Like when a priest is really busy, I tell him, you don't need to do one holy hour. You need to do two, because you've got a lot more responsibilities. That It's completely the opposite of a natural way of thinking. I know people, uh, you know, mothers obviously are going to have to be somewhat creative, more flexible if you're nursing, for example, you can use those times. But I know couples that are very, very busy, homeschooling, etc., still find time to do an hour virtually every day, each one of them. But they didn't start there. Be humble, start with 10 or 15 minutes and have 5 minutes every 3 months. And you can get up to quite a bit of mental prayer. And you should strive for it. Let's turn to the method. The method of mental prayer. What are the steps this method of mental prayer. It's easy. I'm going to give you names, but once you listen to them, you'll see how it all works. The steps. Preparation, reading, meditation with a loving colloquy, colloquy, thanksgiving, offering, petition. So preparation, reading, meditation with a loving colloquy, thanksgiving, offering, petition. Don't so many steps make this method too complicated. Not necessarily. The first two steps, preparation and reading, are not yet prayer, but only sort of an entrance to it. The last three steps, thanksgiving, offering, and the petitioner, optional. In its essence, the heart of mental prayer is meditation accompanied by an intimate conversation with our Lord. That's this loving colloquy. What's the best way to understand the Carmelite method of prayer? By keeping in mind the teaching of St. Teresa, the mental prayer consists in an intimate conversation with our Lord, in which we speak to Him especially of love, responding to His invitation to love Him. The point of the preparation reading is to lead us gently to this loving conversation with Him. How does the preparation serve this purpose? Since we can't speak intimately with anyone if we're not near them, our preparation consists of sending our angel to the Blessed Sacrament and then placing ourselves in the presence of God with a lively faith and in the humble attitude of a soul that knows itself to be a child of God. Now, how hard is that? You kneel down, you set your angel to the Blessed Sacrament, ask him to pray there, and then you just place yourself in prayer in the presence of God. Saying, I believe, I believe I'm in your presence. And I know you're, I'm your child. Anybody can do this. Children can do this. What's the purpose of reading? Reading gives us a topic for the loving conversation with our Lord. What books should we use for this reading? Well, besides books with collections of meditations, all spiritual books that reveal the many manifestations of God's love are good. The Gospels, Imitation of Christ, Various meditation books written by St. Alphonsus for these very purposes, by the way. Those are available. There are meditations for every day of the year written by St. Alphonsus. They're available for for free on religiousbookshelf.com. Religiousbookshelf.com, meditations written by St. Alphonsus for every day of the year. They're free. Just click on it, and there they are. Religiousbookshelf.com. The books of Father Jacques Philippe, Certain Lives of the Saints, and so forth. Anything that inspires an intense love of God in you. That's what you're looking for. Something that speaks to you about how God loves you. It's important not to read out of curiosity and not to just turn the time of mental prayer into nothing more than spiritual reading. How should we read? First of all, we should read with attention. Since the purpose of the reading is to find a topic to have a talk to our Lord about. We should also, in that case, read slowly and with devotion and recollection. Why? Because this makes our soul more attentive and receptive to good ideas. May we resume our reading during the prayer. Well, St. Teresa never went to prayer without taking a book with her, and she's one of the great mystics of the church. When it becomes too difficult to maintain our attention, we can turn back to the book. But we have to be careful not to turn that mental prayer time into spiritual reading. 
It at least ought to remain a meditative reading in which we pause from time to time to make affections and resolutions. Then reading, the reading itself becomes an instrument for our conversation with Christ. So the book, the reading, is a means to an end. It's there to help us to have that loving conversation with Christ. Meditation. Why meditate? The meditation helps us better understand God's love for us. It's shown in the topic that we consider. We're thinking about how he loves us in this particular topic. If we're meditating on a passion, we can think about how he loves us and what he's going through and suffering for us and so forth. So meditation is the immediate preparation for that loving conversation with our Lord. Of what does meditation consist? Again, this has a little less, but it's easy to understand. For the most part, the Carmelite authors distinguish three elements of meditation. One, representation, that's the work of the imagination. Two, reflection, that's the work of the intellect. And three, the colloquy, the work principally of the will, which is an important one. What's representation? That's forming an image, a picture, a representation of the topic. Is it always necessary? No. Some people have lively imaginations. Others are almost incapable of forming image. Some people like to pray with a holy icon right there, a crucifix. That's great. That's a representation. There's no need to spend much time forming representations. A few moments suffice. But of course, we can keep it before us during the whole time of meditation. If we're able to do this, it can help us avoid distractions. The point is that it's not necessary, but it's often useful. It depends on the person. There's a lot of freedom here. If you find it useful, help, you know, then use it. If you find a hindrance, don't bother with it. Just skip right on by. You don't have to think about it. It's just to hold our imagination from wandering around and showing us some ridiculous movie. That's the only, uh, only purpose for it right there. And so that we can keep on the topic. What's the reflection and is it important? Reflection means thinking through the point or points of the discussion. And it is important. It should last until it produces in our mind an actual conviction of being loved by God and being invited to love Him in return. So we ponder the crucifix and think about what He went through for me, if we're thinking about on the passion and being nailed up there. What He went through for me. It's something personal. There's a personal part I'm making. Huh? So we continue to reflect until our will is enkindled with love so as to be able to reign some time at that condition. So this reflection be made methodically. Well, it can be, if that's the kind of person you are. Even St. Teresa counsels in the meditation on the passion of our Lord to consider who is suffering and why, with what dispositions, and so forth. Again, it depends on the person. If those kind of considerations help, use them. If not, don't. The goal is to come to a better understanding of the love of God. What should those do who cannot meditate? St. Teresa should, uh, teaches another way of controlling thoughts to excite love, which can be used by individuals who have a great difficulty in dwelling on a definite idea in order to examine it with the orderly reflections. So they simply recite very slowly a vocal prayer full of meaning to them, pausing to consider very attentively the sense of the words as they're going, and taking the opportunity to form some reflections and express affections as they're going. How does one pass from this meditation, this work of the intellect, to the loving colloquy? The transition should not be made in some sort of precise, a mathematically determined moment, but in a spontaneous way. By making our reflections in the presence of God, and we're seeing that way much more clearly how much God loves us, we feel more easily moved to speak lovingly to Him. Finally, we leave behind all our considerations in order to abandon ourselves fully to the exercise of love and its manifestations. And thus we pass a loving colloquy. In this conversation, we tell God, we repeat in a thousand ways that we love Him, that we desire to love Him more, and to prove our love to Him. This gets easier with practice. It's, some people can do it right out the gate. Most people have to keep practicing and practicing, and it gets easier. Is this colloquy important? This colloquy is actually the most important. It's the central part of prayer. So for that reason, the soul may occupy itself in this way during much of the time of prayer. What do we say in this colloquy? We mainly make known to God our desire to love Him and approve our love. 
And we base that on a reading reflection. We refer to it all these different ways. And so it can take all kinds of forms. Our love may be expressed in the most holy trinity, to our Lord, to our Lady, to a saint, etc. How should this colloquy be made? It can be made in various ways. We may express our affection with words pronounced vocally if we're alone, or in a purely interior way, with expressions of our heart and will. These expressions may be brief and fall one another with sort of a frequency, or they can be rather prolonged, repeating them only at fairly long intervals. It might be enough, and this is uh, actually the best thing, to remain lovingly in our Lord's company. Should this conversation be continuous? Not in the sense that we should be speaking continuously. Carmelite authors expressly teach that this conversation ought not to be too verbose or too excited, but rather peaceful and oftentimes interrupted, as if to permit one to be attentive to God's answers. Does God speak to us in this colloquy? Well, if we were the only ones to speak, it would not be a colloquy. Whereas St. Teresa teaches that God does speak when we pray from the heart. That does not mean that he makes his voice heard in an audible manner in our ears. Nor should we desire to do so. Uh, The exorcists have way more than enough work right now. Thank you very much. But God replies to us by sending us graces of light and love. And those help us understand his ways better. And they inspire our minds with fervor to embrace his ways with greater generosity. Therefore, to listen means to accept these graces and strive to profit by them. How long should this colloquy be prolonged? There are no limits to it. It may occupy the entire time of prayer. The simplification of prayer consists in making reflections less frequently in order to make more room for the affections, and also in having these gradually take a more quiet form with prolonged acts. For beginners, however, it is not easy to remain so long in this simple expression of our love. Therefore, we may have recourse to the last acts of prayer, that is, to thanksgiving, offering, and to petition. So in the beginning, generally, a person has this discourse, discourse of thought, and then these acts of love, they say them periodically and hold them. But as a person progresses in prayer, if they're being generous, they'll get held at a certain point, because God starts moving in and doing it. And so they can just love God without having to go anywhere with that. What is the purpose of these last three parts of prayer, thanksgiving, offering, and petition? The last three parts of prayer, thanksgiving, offering, and petition, serve to prolong more easily our loving conversation with our Lord. They are, in fact, only more definitive acts of affection or various ways of manifesting manifesting our love. Why do we thank God? In our thanksgiving, we express our humble gratitude to our Lord for the gifts we've received from Him. We need to express our gratitude to God. We've received so much from Him, both in the natural and the supernatural order. We're Catholic. Most of us were baptized without delay, been brought up in the true religion. All these are gratuitous gifts of the Lord. We can never sufficiently thank Him for those. How many graces does the Lord continue to pour down upon us? The very prayer we're making is an invitation from Him to penetrate more deeply into our baptism of vocation. So we should show Him our gratitude for everything. And we shouldn't forget the goodness of our Lord that's been poured out on those that are close to us. Our parents, our spouse, children, friends, benefactors, persons confided to our care. Finally, we can thank not only our Lord, but also our Lady and the saints for their intercession on our behalf. What can we offer to God? In the offering, moved by gratitude to God for all the goodness He's poured on us, we want to give Him something. We should make a particular resolution to practice a definite virtue. And I would suggest you actually write it down and you stick to it for a long time. So it's not just random. So we make a particular resolution to practice definite virtue, to struggle generously against the temptation, or to accept with all our hearts some trial or suffering that we're undergoing. These particular resolutions put our prayer into closer contact with daily life. What's the petition? In the petition or request, since we're con- convinced of our poverty and weakness, but we still want to really please our Lord, we implore his aid that we may be successful and faithful to the resolution we just made in the offering. 
So these last three acts are just a prolongation of that loving colloquy that flowed spontaneously from the meditation. That's it. Let's review. What have we seen? We've seen that mental prayer consists in talking to God with the heart in a spontaneous manner, without memorized or prepared formulas. We've seen that in the beginning of the life of prayer, many people encounter great difficulties. They get bored or they're conscious of being very distracted. We've seen that once the devil sees you getting serious about mental prayer, he's going to do everything in his power to prevent you from sticking to it. We've seen that you just have to make up your mind to do it. Make up your mind that nothing, meaning nothing, is going to stop you and then just plow ahead. We've seen that mental prayer is something you have to will to do, and it's something that you can learn. Because you can learn, you'll actually get better at it. We've seen that you need to pick a time and a place to pray, some place you can get to every day, and you need to be something of a stickler about both the time and the place, insofar as they're both under your power. We've seen that when you start, I recommend 10 or 15 minutes for the first three months, then add three minutes after three more months, or five minutes, add five more minutes, so that over time you're going to build up your time in mental prayer. We've seen that if you're faithful, somehow even though you're spending more time in your prayer, it's not going to impact your duties. We've seen that the Carmelite method of mental prayer consists of preparation, reading, meditation accompanied by a loving colloquy, thanksgiving, an offering, and a petition. Although meditation with loving colloquy are the essential parts. We've seen preparation consists of sending our angel to the Blessed Sacrament and placing ourselves in the presence of God. We've seen that reading gives us a topic for that loving conversation with our Lord. We've seen that the Carmelite authors distinguish three elements in the meditation. Representation, which is the work of the imagination. Reflection, which is the work of the intellect. And the loving colloquy, which is the work principally of the will. We've seen that representation is simply forming an image or a picture or representation of the topic. And although it's not necessary, it may be useful. We've seen that reflection means thinking about the topic until we get an actual conviction of being loved by God and being invited to love Him in return. We've seen that by making our reflections the presence of God, and thus seeing more clearly how much God loves us, we feel more easily moved to speak lovingly to Him, and that makes it much more easy for us to pass to that loving colloquy. We've seen that in that conversation we tell God that we love Him, that we desire to love Him more and to prove our love to Him. And this gets easier with practice. We've seen this colloquy is the most important part of prayer, and we should be careful to keep it peaceful and often pause so as to be attentive to God's answer. We've seen that God does answer when we, when we pray from the heart by sending graces of light and love, which makes us understand His ways better. We've seen that the last three parts of prayer, thanksgiving, offering, petition, serve to prolong more easily that loving colloquy with our Lord. We've seen that in our thanksgiving we express our humble gratitude to the Lord for the gifts we receive from Him. We've seen in the offering we should make a particular resolution, I recommend you write it down, to practice definite virtue, to struggle generously against a temptation, or to accept with all our heart some trial or suffering. We've seen that in the petition request, we implore the aid of the Lord to be faithful to the resolution we just made and offered. Let's close. Will we encounter difficulties? Undoubtedly. Absolutely. If for no other reason that we're weak and there is a devil, we are going to encounter difficulties. Are we going to do everything right the first time? No. Not even the 50th time, probably. But as Cheshire said, anything we're doing is worth doing badly. Not on purpose, of course. We do the best we can. But even if we're just stumbling around, we're stumbling around trying to express our love to God. I don't think he won't love it any more than a mother loves a picture that her two-year-old drew and telling her he loves it. It looks like a bunch of scrawls, but she says, I love you, Mom. That'll go up on the refrigerator. It might not go in a gallery with Michelangelo, but it doesn't matter because it's an expression of love from that child to the mother. And that's what we're doing is expressing our love to the Heavenly Father. It takes practice as you go and learn by experience. Remember, God is never going to be outdone in generosity. Never. Never. So make up your mind you're going to start today. Don't wait till you're laying there on that deathbed 
That day is going to come. Don't wait till then. Start today. Start having that loving conversation with Christ today. Start today.